We're here to talk about the week nine waiver wire. I'm here for you. I'm not here for me. I'm I'm done. I'm done with fantasy. I'm checked out. You're getting hoodie Nick for the rest of the season. Must win game last night. George Pickens. I need 13 from him in full PPR. 13. 13. I'm going in knowing some bullshit's going to happen. I'm not going to hit it. Goes out there, first drive, catches a touchdown. No, wait, some offensive lineman 14 yards away hit a fucking face mask penalty. And unnecessary, what are you doing? I'm getting a Broderick Jones jersey, and I'm burning it live on my next cue and assault. I'm letting you know, all right? That's fucking happening. Then number two, catches another touchdown six minutes later in the fucking game or six minutes left in the game, whatever. I don't care. I don't care. George Pickens, toe taps multiple times with the same foot. They call it no touchdown. Of course, he has 11.5 points, and I lose the fucking game by a point and a half. That's where I'm at with fantasy football right now. I'm fucking checked out. I'm going to keep showing up for you. But not for me. Just understand behind these eyes, underneath this hat, underneath this hood, I'm dead inside. There's a lot of windows out here right in front of me that are looking gorgeous. Might just be my next move. This is where I'm at with fantasy football. All right. That's where I'm fucking at with football. I'm going to keep rooting for my Falcons because Kirk's got me in the goddamn trap house right now. But outside of that, I'm done. I'm done. Week nine waiver wire. Let's, Let's fucking get into it. As always, we will go down the trending list of players, the most added players thus far of the week, the most dropped players thus far, and I'll let you know my thoughts on all of them. Just the overall thought for this week. This week, as Stinky from Hey Arnold would say, this week, bots. Okay? There's there's not much ruminating on the waiver wire. If you're in, like, any semblance of a sharp league, the guys like Cedric Tillman and and those, like, prized possessions for the week were picked up. I don't know that I can name a single intriguing running back to pick up this week. They are all just like the same recycled names every single week of uh, high upside handcuff backs. So like the the Blake Corums, the Braylon Allens, the, you know, the Ray Davises, those guys, they should be owned at this point in the season because, again, you're not going to have like running back breakouts going into week 10. It's all just about this guy get injured. Who is his backup? Is he owned? If not, he's the top waiver wire pickup of the week. So those guys all need to be rostered. Uh, But let's look at the ad drop list. And Parker Washington makes the top of the list probably because he was the least owned of anyone and he's still 0% rostered. Now, with the Jags wide receiver group, we have Christian Kirk lost for the season. We have Gabe Davis with a shoulder injury. We have Brian Thomas with a rib slash chest injury, which reports say that he's likely to miss two to four weeks, which leaves almost nobody available outside of Evan Ingram. Now, Parker Washington is... A player from Penn State, I actually really liked him coming out as a prospect. He's kind of like, he's got a little bit of like a Debo skill set where he's built like a like a running back and he's playing mostly in the slot. You like to get him the ball in his hands and make him and let him make plays after the catch. Now, he showed some glimpses last year as a rookie where he had like a couple good games once Christian Kirk went out, but it, it didn't last very long. So I'm, I'm not getting overly optimistic about it, but he should be owned just because of the lack of options here. I just think this means Evan Ingram probably gets like 10 targets a game, if not more going forward. And uh, Trevor Lawrence is probably going to struggle without his top options here to separate. But Parker Washington's definitely do that you could, you know, pick up stash, see what happens if he ends up emerging or like breaking out a little bit. Similarly to, you know, like Cedric Tillman or these, these guys in the Browns offense where somebody's got to pick up the slack for a defense that's going to let up 25, 30, 35 points a game, they're going to have to throw the ball in order to compete here. So I think Washington could be a nice like flex PPR play if things break in his favor. Next, we have Cedric Tillman. Like I can't believe he's only 25% rostered, but he has now showed up in back-to-back games with Jameis Winston. I will say the Cleveland schedule gets much, much harder going forward. Like they have the Chargers next week, then they have a bye. At New Orleans is a nice matchup, but then Pittsburgh twice in the next three weeks at Denver, Kansas City. So five out of the next six matchups, including a bye, Uh, are really, really tough defenses. Now, Jameis might just continue to sling that fucking thing, and that would be big for Cedric Tillman. I think there's been like a little bit of broken coverage action going on with Cedric Tillman's uh, production, but that being said, the target volume is very, very high. The production is very, very high. He's not someone who's just like racking up cheap slot targets like Elijah Moore in this offense. He's someone who's running tougher routes against the top cornerbacks on the opposing defenses, which does lend itself to feel a little bit more predictive and someone who's running deeper routes and posts and and digs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Tillman's just like this big body possession receiver that's taking over the Amari Cooper role. He's now a full-time 
every down player in this offense. And, you know, again, Jameis is clearly capable of throwing for 300 plus yards. So I think Tillman's a dude that you can pretty confidently throw into your flex spot right now because we've now seen ceiling games. We don't exactly know what his floor game is with Jameis there. Maybe he goes out next week and goes four for 36. But now we're looking at back to back weeks where he's catching eight passes and putting up 80 plus yards. Last week, he obviously scored two touchdowns. So he was like a week winning type of player. And if Jameis continues to stay hot and stay accurate and like lead this team with now an uh, offensive line that's actually healthy and at full strength for the first time this season, like we might continue to see really good games out of Cedric Tillman. Keon Coleman, he is not available in any serious leagues. Elijah Moore, you know, if we if we just talk about the receiver group out there in uh out there in Cleveland, like Njoku, I think is the number one player here in terms of like what we can expect going forward and stability. He's just been a mainstay at tight end now with Jameis Winston under center. So Njoku, Cedric Tillman, and then Elijah Moore is getting, you know, a bunch of these yards per target numbers of of six, of seven, you know, five. That's like what type of player he is. He doesn't get downfield shots. They use him a lot uh, around the line of scrimmage. Now we saw what, what is probably his ceiling game here, eight for 85 in a game where they had to throw the ball a million times. Now, again, in when they're playing teams like the Chargers, the game script won't go that way. It won't be a slug it out, throw the ball a ton, high scoring affair. This is a game that the, the Chargers want to rely on the ground game. They want to slow the game down. They want to give their defense rest. And I think that lends itself to way fewer pass attempts for Jameis Winston. If he's not throwing the ball 40, 45 times a game, Elijah Moore's not getting 12 targets. He's not catching eight passes, right? Like six for 40. I think that's a semi-reasonable game, and that was in a much better matchup against Cincinnati here. But that's probably what you should expect going forward. Somewhere between like seven, maybe 10 PPR fantasy points per game. As you can see, he does not have a single touchdown on the year. He's not used in that part of the field. Jameis likes slinging the ball and taking shots downfield, and that is not the type of receiver that Elijah Moore is. Those aren't the type of routes that he is running. Kate Otten obviously needs to be owned. He should have been owned last week. Calvin Austin, that's fool's gold. We're not buying into that. The only reason he had a big game is because I needed George Pickens to have a good game. So naturally, that wasn't going to happen, meaning another receiver had to have a big game. We could talk about the Houston Texans wide receivers here because we have Stefan Diggs likely out for the remainder of the season with an ACL tear. We don't have news, but that probably means that it's because we're getting bad news. Usually, uh, when they take a long time to give you the news, it's because they're getting a second and third opinion. And when you get a second and third opinion, that's typically because you didn't like the first opinion. You didn't like the second opinion. So it's like, come on, let me go to a third guy and you tell me something different here. They're just they're just buying their time here, uh, which means they're going to have a mixture. Obviously, Tank Dell is the receiver to own now. Dalton Schultz is a nice floor play, I think, in this offense. Mechie, I was never a fan of Mechie coming out of Bama. I always thought he was fake hype because he came out of Bama. Um, I'm not a, a big fan of the player. I, I Xavier Hutchinson is fine as well. I just think we've seen this offense just struggle as a passing offense overall. And I don't think just because these players are out, Diggs and Nico's out, like we, we should expect, okay, Stroud's going to throw for 300 a game regardless of the weapons. Like we've seen him struggle. And I think we're just going to see a bunch of 180, 215 yard passing days where it's like Tank gets 80, Schultz gets 50, Joe Mixon gets, you know, 30, whatever it is. And then there's like 80 yards left between three wide receivers. So I'm not overly optimistic about these guys, Mechie, Xavier Hutchinson. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be running out to spend uh, fab on any of them. Yeah, I mean, the, the rest of the waiver wire is just like fake news all around here. There's there's nobody on this trending list that is unowned in, in serious leagues or that I'm actually uh, you know interested in. Darius Slayton is usually going to have terrible games when Malik Neighbors pops off. He had some uncharacteristic drops last night that wouldn't have went his way. Taysom Hill is actually someone that I really, really want to highlight here. Taysom Hill came back for the first time this week. Uh, in week eight against the Chargers. So he had a three-week layoff, played 40% of the snaps. He will get healthier. And now the Saints play the Panthers. Now the Panthers are, you know, the worst defense in the league by far, maybe the worst defense over the last like half decade. And where it gets interesting for Taysom Hill is like even, even the backups of the backups score fantasy points against Carolina. That's the way that defense works. Kendra Miller pulled his hamstring. Bub Means suffered a high ankle sprain. Rashid Shaheed is already on the IR. Taysom Hill is going to be used a lot in this upcoming game. It might be as the backup to Kamara, which is super valuable. I think we get Derek Carr back, which means the offense should probably run a little bit more smoothly than it has in recent weeks. Uh, Juwan Johnson also went into the concussion protocol, but he cleared, so it does sound like he was going to play. If he didn't play, I'd almost rank Taysom Hill as like a top 10, top 8 tight end this week. I still think he'll get 
uh, a bunch of work because of the banged up receiver position there in New Orleans, plus uh, the running back Kendra Miller injury and like Jamal Williams hasn't shown shit. So I could see Taysom Hill getting one or two goal line carries in this one. So I actually think if you are desperate at the tight end position, Taysom Hill is a premier target for this week on the waiver wire. And if you want to talk about being desperate, while I'm done with fantasy, we as a company are not done operating. Unfortunately, I'm uh, we are we are looking for actually we're looking for two positions. We're looking for one, a CEO. I'm going to hire you so that you can fire me. That's number one. So if you think it'd be a good CEO of this company, you want to come in and let me go. You're fucking hired. You get all, all the money. Secondly, though, if we can't find a CEO, we are looking for one to two software engineers uh, that have experience coding with Ruby on Rails. That is specific. Please do not apply if you're like, I don't have any coding experience. I just love ball. Don't don't, don't care. Love you for the support, but don't care. Please don't waste our time with the job application here. We're looking for software engineers that know Ruby on Rails. Uh, this will be a remote position. If you are talented enough, uh, we have the application linked down below. So if you're interested, you can find out more about that job posting plus apply down below. And we will be reaching out shortly because the application process will be closing at the end of this week. Also, send it to someone if you think that they would be a good fit for this job. Smoochies. You know, and while we're on uh, just relevant fantasy white players, because the list is, is not very long, I think a sharp pickup right now would be Adam Thielen because Andy Dolan will be back under center soon. Adam Thielen got back to a limited practice last week, did not play yet. But more importantly, Schefter came out and said, there's a very high likelihood that Deontay Johnson gets traded before the trade deadline. He doesn't come out and say shit like that unless there's a lot of smoke underneath that fire, right? These aren't just like fantasy people continuing to say, oh, Deontay Johnson should get traded because I looked at his contract on a website and it just makes sense. Like, no, when Schefter comes out and says that, that means there are interests from teams. That means the Panthers are coming out and probably saying that they are interested in moving them. And that that's the type, type of games that these motherfuckers play. Like the agent of Deontay Johnson probably said that to Schefter so that Schefter could tweet that. And now teams are probably inquiring. It makes all the sense in the world for Deontay Johnson to go to the L.A. Chargers and give him another weapon on the outside to separate. They would go from some of the worst receivers in the league to like a really solid weapons group just like that. Wouldn't have had to spend that first round pick and said got Joe all. And now you have Deontay Johnson for probably like a fourth or fifth round pick. And because he's already in the building, the likelihood of you being able to extend him in the offseason and be the one that gives him the contract also very high. And, and the likelihood is there. So Deontay Johnson to the Chargers. I don't want to like say it's a guarantee, but like if I had to put my money or maybe just like best landing spot, that makes a ton of fucking sense there. So if Deontay Johnson gets moved. Adam Thielen, Xavier Leggett, Jalen Coker is another name at the bottom of uh, waiver wire list right now. If you're in a deeper league, if you're in a 10 or 12 team league, I'm not probably really seriously considering Jalen Coker in a roster spot, but he's a late round rookie who has showed up pretty well. I mean, there's just a lot of hype around him on Twitter right now. People are just like posting PFF grades of him. He had like the 25 yard touchdown catch at the end of the game on Sunday. That was literally like the last play of the Carolina game. Uh, so... I'm not like overly excited about it, but if you're in a 14 team league, 16 team league, and you're like desperate at the end of the roster, you know, Deontay gets moved. I think Coker's worth uh, adding, but when Thielen comes back, he'll probably be the top target of Andy Dalton. And I think he could be a nice PPR play for you. So I like Leggett for that reason as well. Like I think him and Adam Thielen will probably share big target days. Also Xavier Leggett, like Bryce, Bryce Young missed him on a wide fucking open 70-yard touchdown down the seam. Like, we just have to be better. Someone on my team has to do something. We just have to. We have to. Oh, I hate fantasy football so much. I hate all you guys for liking fantasy, for making me continue to do this bullshit. Let's keep on moving. So pick up Adam Thielen because nobody else is paying attention to him right now. Nick Westbrook-Akini has scored in three straight games. I don't think I'm seriously considering rostering him outside of really deep leagues. Like his one catch for nine yards, two catches for 10 yards, two catches for 39 yards. It was kind of telling, though. This was the first game without D-Hop, and we saw his – uh, snap share jump up to 92%. They have some tough matchups coming up, the New England Chargers, Minnesota, Houston. Down the stretch, though, that playoff schedule is holy motherfucker. Oh, yeah, we made that trade target video a few weeks back, and I said go trade for uh, Calvin Ridley because no one wants him, and his playoff schedule down the stretch. Washington, Jacksonville, Cincinnati, Indy, Jacksonville. Are you fucking kidding me? My lord. 
Uh, Nick Westbrook probably should be picked up just because of the matchups and D-Hop now being off the roster. Now, Isaac Garendo is another one of those like handcuff backs. C-Mac is reportedly going to be back after week nine. That is their bye. This upcoming week, we have the 49ers on a bye, and we have the Steelers on a bye. So when they come back, I expect C-Mac to be playing. Isaac Garendo looked really good. But it's too many moving parts to really spend any serious amount of fab on him. Jordan Mason banged up his shoulder again, so maybe he misses some time. But overall, if I'm a C-Mac owner, maybe I pick up Garendo because maybe he's the handcuff going forward because of Mason's injury. But overall, like because they have the bye coming up, there's there's not much to get overly excited about here. As we move down, there's no one really serious that we want to be looking at here, man. There really isn't. I already talked about Jalen Coker. Demarcus Robinson, I said this in, in the game-by-game game recap yesterday, so I do that every single Monday. I go game-by-game game just recapping everything that happened in fantasy. So if you want to enjoy that or hate that every single Monday like I do, subscribe to the channel, turn notifications on. It lets you know when I go live, usually around 1 p.m. Eastern time. But that's up on the channel right now under the live tab if you want to go uh, re-watch the recaps from yesterday. But I was just basically saying that like Demarcus Robinson, when he's the wide receiver three, He's like the Jerry Rice of wide receiver threes. When he has to be the wide receiver one, he's Kadarius fucking Tony, all right? And now that Puka and Cooper Cup are back, D-Rob is like semi-playable, I suppose, because he gets absolutely no attention. So, I mean, that that I guess you could do worse. And as always with streaming defenses, we have pretty much three rules that we live by. We want teams that are favored to win their game. Always, you don't want to be starting a defense that's not even supposed to win their real-life game. The bigger the spread, the better. And if they are at home, that is mwah. so if you go off that formula, some teams that are likely highly unowned in leagues, like obviously Baltimore's minus nine at home, Buffalo minus six at home, but like they're probably not available in most leagues. The Cincinnati Bengals are seven and a half point favorites at home versus the Raiders. That would be suggested. Number one, the Saints are seven point favorites on the road against Carolina. Philly, seven and a half point favorites against the super banged up Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, at home, so I love that as well. We got the Minnesota Vikings minus six against Indy at home, but they're probably not very heavily available out there. But I would go Philly, the Saints, and Cincy as my as my defensive streamers of the week. And as always, I'll just quickly roll down the trending down tab to let you know whether or not I'd hold on to these players. Dalvin Cook, he's clearly fucking chalked. Um, Rico Dowdle will be back and Cook will probably be back into a zero roll there. Droppable. Sterling Shepard. I don't know what the deal is with his hamstring. He pulled his hamstring in the game. So if that's a, a if he misses any time, he is absolutely droppable. Otherwise, I would probably expect normal games ahead for him. Sean Tucker, I think you could probably drop him too. too. Owl, you could drop him with those guys back. Singletary, I definitely would not drop. Palmer is droppable. Juwan Jennings, I would hold on to through the bye weeks. I think he'll have a role when he comes back. Tolbert, I definitely would not drop. That's just the product of when you're splitting wide receiver snaps with CeeDee Lamb, sometimes it's just going to be a CeeDee Lamb game and you're just going to be left with cookie scraps out there. Komet, what are we doing dropping him? Absolutely not. Uh, Dearness Johnson, I expect ETN back, so Johnson's droppable. Sermon, definitely droppable. Lazard, I think, is definitely droppable as well. Ricky Pearsall, I would hold on to both him and Jawan Jennings through the bye because we don't know what's going to happen with the wide receiver 2-3 position there. Like Maybe they want to develop Pearsall and let him get more snaps towards the end of the season, but I think Shanahan probably trusts Jawan Jennings more. I'd kind of want to hold on for a game. Justice Hill, same shit, different week. People want to drop him after a bad game and pick him up after a good game. It's literally the same thing over and over and over again. Jordan Addison would love to fucking drop his dumb ass four point ass motherfucker but no i'm not gonna drop him clyde droppable mason no don't drop bub you could definitely drop jordan whittington unfortunately yeah you could drop him now he's moved so far down the depth chart lock it no we're not dropping him because dk will continue to miss time most likely uh parkinson yeah i mean you could definitely do better at the tight end position romeo dobbs absolutely not rico dowdle absolutely not trey tucker probably droppable wicks i still wouldn't drop Godwin. Yeah, obviously <laughs> you could drop him. Jacob Cowing is droppable. Damian Pierce, he's a high-end handcuff again behind Joe Mixon, but if you need the room, you can drop him. Same thing with Emmanuel Wilson. Same thing with Tyler Goodson. Uh, Kamani Vidal, another one. These are all guys that like I'd like to have on my roster if I don't need the spot because they're one injury away, guys. They're one injury away, guys, from being the top waiver wire add on this list. So I think that's the way you should rank it if you ask yourself, like, okay, if Jacobs were to get hurt, 
Would Emmanuel Wilson be the number one waiver wire pickup that week? If both Dobbins and Jacobs get hurt, who would be the number one waiver wire pickup on the week? For me, it's Kamani Vidal over Emmanuel Wilson. So that's how I would rank them in terms of prioritizing them on your team and holding on to them. They're both going to give you pretty much like zero to three points week over week over week. But if the guy gets hurt above them, which we can't predict which one of them is going to get hurt, which one would take priority? And that's how I would typically look at those. Semi Fahoko, you could drop. Ray Ray's droppable. Michael Pittman, I you know, I'm not dropping him, but like you you really can't play him right now. Cam Akers, definitely droppable. Tyler Algier, definitely not droppable. All right. So that is the drop list. The last thing that is absolutely droppable is you dropping a goddamn thumbs up on this video if you enjoyed it. If you're in as much pain as I am, this will be the only way to heal my pain is to hit the thumbs up fucking button on this video. Let me know that you want me to continue on. Oh, I'll stop right now. I'll stop right now for the remainder of the season. I'm good. I'm good. You just, you guys just say the word and I'm done. Cut me out. Cut me out. But also, if you're a developer that does Ruby on Rails, please apply to this position. We would love to hire you and we'd love to build out cool ass shit and great products with you. That's all we have for the week nine waiver wire. Unfortunately, we'll be back for the rest of this week with running back rankings, wide receiver rankings. And we are covering, if you guys are new to the BDG ecosphere, the league that I'm just crying about right now that I just can't stop yapping about, we call it your idiot league mates. It's all the dudes in the office. We're competing against each other for a very large grand prize and a very shitty last place prize, which is why I'm upset about last night's loss. Last place punishment, I should say. We document that entire league on the Your Idiot League Mates YouTube channel. So if you just search Your Idiot League Mates on YouTube, you'll be able to find the league, put out a bunch of videos each week documenting it. We do podcasts in the in the studio. So that's it. That's all I got for you. Uh, I'll see you when I see you. Smoochies.